Looking to expand their creativity and recapture some of the Bronner R feel from their writing sessions for Led Zeppelin 3, the band moved operations to Headley in Hampshire, more specifically Headley Grange. A three-story building originally used as an institution for the poor, orphaned, and illegitimate children. The house was attacked in 1830 by a mob of violent civilians. After many repairs, it was bought and sold many times, until it was made a hostel for local art students. It definitely caught the attention of a former art school student himself, Jimmy Page, who heard Fleetwood Mac had used it for rehearsals. The 200-year-old building had a sinister vibe and no heating. Because it was away from the city distractions, it would allow the band to focus exclusively on the music. Jimmy was amused by how Robert Plant and John Bonham were freaked out by the house's eerie ambience. Page has been quoted saying he saw great shapes in rooms and such. Now on the positive side of things, Headley Grange had great acoustics that would add feel to the recordings. The Rolling Stones mobile truck was booked with Andy Johns hired as engineer, coming back for his third Zeppelin collaboration past the second and the third album. The band's month-long stay in the Haunted Mansion gave them enough time to practice, practice, and then some more. Jimmy Page said this song was made on the spot after fooling around with John Paul Jones' mandolin. The intro features a chromatic bass motif over an A minor triad that lives in the same universe of Stairway to Heaven. The track is also a tribute to British folk music and Celtic heritage. The verse employs an A minor, C and G chord structure, which again can be found on Stairway. We can think of this as Folkway to Heaven. The chorus employs a somewhat turnaround chord of G7 for resolution. I read this on countless magazines that Fairport Convention Sandy Denny recorded guest vocals for the song. What they don't tell you is that Sandy Denny actually left the Fairport Convention, past her Full House album from July 1970. She would return on and off for three more albums with Fairport, all the way through 1974. Fun fact, the band's drummer for all these records was Dave Maddox, who provided his talents for Jimmy Page's Death Wish 2 soundtrack from 1982. Led Zeppelin shared the concert bill of Bath 1970 with Fairport Convention. Sandy's friendship with Robert made this collaboration possible. Another fun fact here, Robert Plant played at Fairport's Cropery Festivals in 1992, 1993, 2000, and 2008. Battle of Evermore had Robert Plant narrating a battle scene with Sandy Denny as a protagonist, crying for help as a sort of call and response situation. With the country scenery, it was only natural that Robert Plant was inspired by the Lord of the Rings saga for Battle of Evermore's lyrics. The song was revived for Led Zeppelin's 1977 North American tour, with a questionable and hilarious vocal performance by John Paul Jones. Mandolin duties were carried out by Page, with Bonham adding percussion. While it was a good effort, they just couldn't replicate the studio version's feel. Contrary to popular belief, it's a very difficult song to pull on stage. It was also featured on Let It's studio album and tour. Robert came back to the song with Alison Krauss on their own concert tours. Sandy Denny suffered from depression and alcoholism, which caused her to inflict pain on herself, such as falling down the stairs. She passed away in 1978 as a result of a traumatic brain hemorrhage. She was 31 years old. Inspired by the Legalized Herbs Rally of 1968, Robert Plant sang about idealism and freedom, with of course, Tolkien references of the Misty Mountains, present in The Hobbit. As for the song itself, this one features Hedley Grange's heavily compressed big drum sound, which John Bonham played with style and a tasteful selection of fills. The main riff has a double string attack similar to four sticks plus a verse section that employs a chromatic carousel effect of D major, C minor diminished, and C sharp diminished. Quite an odd choice for chords here, which creates a feeling of confusion that is resolved with a response of D major, G major, and A major, which follow the color palette of Black Dog and Stay With Heaven. Jimmy's guitar solo was light years ahead, with a triple harmony over dub construction that influenced many bands, including feature heavy metal groups.
Misty Mountain Hop made two brief appearances on stage in May 1971 and was later discarded. It was brought back until October 1972 in Japan, all the way through the 1973 tour. Then it was put on hold again. One thing that has always bothered me about live renditions of the song is how much it needed additional bass frequencies. While John Paul Jones played this on keyboards, they never managed to replicate the power and explosion of the studio cut. With them sometimes rushing the tempo, it was a transition vehicle track within their set. And just a personal thought here, I wish Jones would have played bass on these live versions and have Jimmy replicate the keyboard stuff. Because of the keyboard influence of Into the Outdoor, the song was brought back for its final four performances in 1979 at both Copenhagen and Nepworth. The post Led Zeppelin story saw this played on the 1988 and 2007 reunions. Robert Plant has played this track 219 times on his solo tours, while Page and Plant only did 7 takes on this for their 1998 concerts. An acoustic showcase in the style of Led Zeppelin's 3's That's the Way. Another one of Jimmy's open tunings, this time low to high, D A D G B D. In other words, tuning the 6th and 1st string down to D. Where every article in Zeppelin 4 mentions Joni Mitchell as one of the main musical inspirations for the song, I have to mention the works of English guitarist and songwriter John Renborn. Check out his albums up to 1970, including a 1966 record with Bert Jansch, who we know had a huge influence on Page. John Renborn's work employs the use of open tunings as well as melodic themes. You will find the roots of Battle of Evermore, Stairway to Heaven and Going to California in his music. Fun fact, John Paul Jones produced Renborn's album from 1986. So with the instrumental mix for Going to California ready by January, we can speculate Robert added his vocals back at Island Studios in February. Why? Well, his lyrics talk about a California earthquake that actually happened on February 9th, 1971, which is the same week when Stairway and Down by the Seaside were recorded. The Silmer quake severely damaged the northern part of the San Fernando Valley. While Jimmy Page recorded guitars and mandolin for this song, string duties changed on stage with John Paul Jones on mandolin and Jimmy on guitar. The song was performed as a part of the acoustic set from March 5th, 1971 until June 27th, 1972. Going to California made a small comeback on all five dates at Ells Court, as well as the entire tour of 1977. With a relatively simple structure and chord selection, it was a good song to relax in between a very demanding set list except maybe for the D minor and A7 section, where Robert Plant would go for the high notes. He could no longer replicate past 1975. This song holds the record as Robert Plant's most performed track as a solo artist with 459 plays. Page and Plant did 126 runs on both on Lennon and Walking into Clarksdale tours. And finally, John Paul Jones played this nine times on his Zuma tours of 1999 and the year 2000. John Bonham's career-defining drum sound starts off the excursion into the disquieting and frightening trails of the blues. As we all know, Bonzo's drums here are the result of heavy compression, an echo machine, and a delay effect unit. I definitely recommend Rick Beato's video on this topic, as well as George Flute's Bonhamology analysis on the drumming for Led Zeppelin IV. Guitar magazines always talk about the drums, but what about the bass, guitar, and harmonica? It's been said that Jimmy slowed down the tape to thicken the sound of the 12 string guitar and harmonica parts. There seems to be two theories on this matter. First one states that Jimmy played this on open G and then slowed things down to F, which is the key we hear in the final recording. The second theory has Jimmy playing in open E, then slowing it down to E flat and then going up to F. I did a small test of both scenarios and going with the open E tuning was by far the best choice in retaining string dynamics. We 
We'll never know what the exact technique was, but there are two important pieces of evidence out there. When the levee breaks was played three times as a weird standalone number in January 1975, checking all three versions you realize playing this in open G just doesn't cut it. The resonance and vibe is not the same, which proves the point of why playing open E and then working out the tape separately is a better way to achieve the studio sound. The fact that this song is so hard to replicate live makes it much more special as a creative milestone for the band. Robert Plant's lyrics borrowed many parts from Memphis Mini and Kansas Joy McCoy's original recording released in 1929. The song itself was inspired by the Great Mississippi Flood of 1927. Only Led Zeppelin could transform this blues number into a three-dimensional expedition of accomplished sonic architecture. The track was somewhat revived in 1995 for Led Zeppelin's induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with a crazy Neil Young shredding all over. When the Levy Breaks has been performed by Robert Plant the solo artist, Page and Plant the duet, and most fascinating of them all, it was played by John Paul Jones on his solo tours of 1999 all the way through the year 2001. The song appeared in two Hollywood movies, those being 2012's Argo and 2015's The Big Short. Both instances where the song comes in make Led Zeppelin steal the show. Like Black Dog, rock and roll became a permanent fixture on the Zeppelin set list from March 1971 all the way up to their final show. It was played as an encore up to the band's second visit to Japan in 1972, which thereon it would be the opener until 1975. It went back to the encore position from 1977 all the way through 1980. It's popular knowledge by now that the drum intro was inspired by Little Richard's 1958 hit Keep On Aukin. We've heard the story, the band was trying to finish the recording of Four Sticks, and such task was going nowhere. So John Bonham went to the Chuck Berry number. While this story has been repeated endlessly, Four Sticks was actually recorded on November 2nd, 1970 at Island Studios. So this means the band could have been working on Four Sticks, yes, but as a rehearsal or run through. This means an out of the blue jam into rock and roll was possible without the actual pressure of recording. Now on the riff itself, as we know Jimmy Page was a huge fan of Link Gray's work. It seems his 1963 hit by the name of Run Chicken Run fits John Bonham's drum beat just perfect. Many details from this song inspired Led Zeppelin's version. The Rolling Stones' own Ian Stewart was called in for piano overdubs recorded in February 1971 at Island Studios. Stewart played a very important role in the Stones' early years and had also provided piano parts for Howling Wolf's 1971 album, The London Howling Wolf Sessions. Fun fact, Ian Stewart's piano is the one you hear in George Thorogood's 1982 hit, Bat to the Bone. Night Flight, one of those rare Zeppelin pieces that has no exact recording date outside of January 1971. With Jones' prominent organ sound and Bonham's hard-hitting laid-back beat, this one could have easily fit their debut album Intentions of 1968. I'd like to think of it as You Shook Me Part 2, 
Opening chords have Jimmy working a similar style that would be later found on a feature number, the song remains the same. Verse sections on this track have some of the Rolling Stones vibe to it, with Robert's vocals all over the place. This was shelved as an outtake and later used for physical graffiti. While Led Zeppelin never played this on an official concert, it made its way onto a 1973 soundcheck in the United States. Some sources say it was May 4th at the Brave Stadium, Atlanta, while others say it was Chicago Stadium on July 6th. I say this one is from Atlanta. The song was played five times by Page and Plan during their Walking Into Everywhere tour of 1998. Another one of the Zeppelin mysteries with no information of the recording date. Story has it that Ian Stewart visited the Rolling Stones mobile studio at Headley Grange and found an old piano in the main room, which was out of tune. He started playing it, Jimmy Page and Bonzo joined, and the tapes were rolling. Because the style of the song is very similar to the Zeppelin's rock and roll, I think this was actually recorded in early January 1971, before rock and roll was laid on tape. My reasoning is that this was the first time they played with Stewart, which probably gave them the idea for bringing him back for overdubs in rock and roll. This also explains why Boogie with Stu was shelved until Physical Graffiti in 1975. The song's original mix had no echo applied on Bonham's percussive track, no reverb on Robert's vocals, and Ian Stewart's piano was kind of drowned in the mix. Now we can speculate who's playing rhythm guitar and mandolin. It could either be Jamie Page on both, or maybe Jones on acoustic and Jimmy on mandolin, which would make Boogie Woods 2 something they could record it on the same session for Battle of Evermore on January 29th. Robert Plant's lyrics were taken from the Richie Vadden song from 1958, Ooh My Head. Valence's mother, Concepcion Reyes de Valenzuela, was listed as one of the composers for the song, so she would get some royalties. Her name was added as Mrs. Valence on the record. She unfortunately passed away in October 1987. 